Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here today. So the topic of our panel is financing the SDGs. And this is an unsolved challenge even two years after the SDGs have been adopted. We know that the SDGs require trillions of dollars of additional public and private investment. And we also know that there is ample capital in this world and ample wealth in this world that is waiting to be mobilized. But despite this coexistence of capital and needs, we still don't have the mechanisms at scale to solve the problem at hand. We're very lucky today to have two leaders in this space who will actually help us get out of this conundrum. To my left, we have uh, Mr. Alexander de Croo, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Development Cooperation, Digital Agenda, Post and Telecom in the Belgian Federal Ca Cabinet. Mr. de Croo previously served as the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Pensions for his government. And to his left, we have Mr. Hervé Dutay, and he is the Regional Coordinator for Sustainable Finance at BNP Paribas, and has spent over 20 years in the financial services industry in a variety of roles around the world. So we have perspectives from both the public sector and the private sector, and I'm just really ecstatic to see what we can come up with to solve these problems. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister, why don't we start with you? Uh, five minute opening remarks, and then we'll hand it over to Hervé and take it from there. Okay, um, thank you for this uh, very nice introduction. Uh, when we are talking about uh, financing for the SDGs, uh, one of the main topics that will always come into the discussion is ODA, Official uh, Development Aid, uh, for who does not, not ring a bell, it's the infamous 0.7%. Uh, um, now, is ODA really the key to unlock uh, development? Um, my hypothesis here is that it is not uh, the case. Um, and I would just like to, to, to start with one, uh, one example. Uh, two countries, uh, Ethiopia and the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, both sub-Saharan countries, fairly dissimilar size, coming out of a conflict end of the, uh, end of the 90s. Um, if their GNI, gross national income, in the end of the 90s was 100, then you see that in the DRC it is today about 400, and you see that in Ethiopia today it is about 700. So, if the thinking would be that ODA is the key to development, then we would have to conclude that Ethiopia has received a lot more official development assistance than the DRC has received. That's not the case. It's actually quite the opposite. The DRC has received a lot more official development uh, aid the main difference, obviously, was that the governance in Ethiopia was much better than the governance in, uh, in the DRC. Throughout the world, today, we do not really see a correlation between the success and development and how much ODA we are uh, pouring in. What we see is that development is taking place in stable environments and is taking place in countries where there is a certain political will. This is more about policy than it is about pouring money in. And maybe another, another great example of development, and it's a completely side of the, the other side of the world, it's in China, and it's a policy that Deng Xiaoping uh, introduced, is that end, end of the 70s, at some point, he allowed uh, farmers to produce more than the quota they had to sell to the state, and to produce more, but also sell it on the market. The fact that the farmers were allowed to sell on the market, created um, entrepreneurship, created profit, profit, created investment, and so on. This is just giving a little bit more freedom and improving the lives for more than 10 million of people. So in the end, what it is about, it's about governance, about political will, and about sound policies. These are the real factors that drive sustainable development. Financing will only have its role when the political space is there to allow financing to play its, uh, its role. Does that mean that financing has no role to play whatsoever? No, that's not what I said. What I said is that there is a precondition for financing to help in development. And that is 
very different on the type of country you're talking about. When we are talking about middle-income countries, um, this is mostly about domestic resource mobilization. This is about uh, foreign, uh, foreign direct investment. This is about remittances, capital markets, and so on. If we are talking about the least developed countries, the least developed countries are today very, very dependent on foreign assistance. Now, all the ODA in the world is never going to be sufficient to achieve the SDG agenda in the least developed countries. That means that you have to open it up to other sources of financing. Private sector, for example, and private sector that will invest if there's profit. And profit is actually a good thing, also in development. If you want those financial flows to come, then there needs to be a perspective of profit. And a decent profit, I'm not talking about monopolistic uh, profit, I'm not talking about tax evasion, but a decent profit means that people can get hired, means that there can be investment, means that there is an economic cyclus uh, taking, uh, taking place. In my perspective, ODA is a very outdated concept. If we want to look into financing today, I think we need to look at it from another perspective. We need to look at it from the perspective of leverage. For every dollar or euro of ODA, how much other types of investments are you pulling in? Basically, I think you should look at ODA the way we look at a hedge fund today in the financial market. ODA should also be something that partners with the private investment and a private investment that is looking for impact and looking for results. And this is also about uh, values. Pouring money in is not the solution. Investing in human rights, investing in empowerment is a real thing. If we make sure that a girl can go to school, this is a good thing for demographics, but it's also a good thing because she can become an entrepreneur. And becoming an entrepreneur is the best way of driving development. This is about free enterprise. It is about having governance being accountable. So I would say um, development is not so much about finance, it is about empowerment. If you empower people, then, develop, then financing can have its role and drive the sustainable development goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. DeCrew. Harvey, over to you. Good morning. First of all, Prime, Deputy Prime Minister, thank you so much for your, your remark. And what you said does resonate very much uh, to me from the private sector. My name is Hervé Dutte. For over 20 years, I've traded derivatives or managed capital market activities. And a little over three years ago, I took over the role of heading corporate social responsibility for BNP Paribas. And when a trader takes over CSR, believe me, it's not to repaint classrooms in the Bronx, or at least not just that. Um, my view, you see, is very much that when it comes to CSR, when it comes to corporate responsibility towards society, our first and foremost responsibility is to come up with business solutions, not just philanthropic ones. So fast forward to today, this has led to the creation of our sustainable fi uh, finance practice. And I will share t with you a couple of perspectives, and especially I think that's what you wanted, Aniket, um, one example of a, of a product that starts moving the, bo the ball when it comes to financing the SDGs. So first of all, what is our problem from, from the private sector, and especially from a bank's perspective? It's how to unlock capital from pension funds, from insurance companies, from sovereign wealth funds, and especially from what we call mainstream investors or retail investors, that is probably most of you here. And to solve that problem, one has to understand what, what is the key pain point of those private sector um, stakeholders to invest. And that has to do with return, that has to do with risk, that has to do with liquidity. When you invest something, you may want your money back tomorrow. And that has to do with, ti with time horizon. These are the tenets which are embedded um, into shareholders' expectations, 
and as well within fiduciaries. And, and they come before any other civil society expectation somehow. So this is what we have to deal with. We have to either fit the, these requirements, and we, the private sector, can do something around those constraints, or one has to change those requirements, but this is what policy can do, not the private sector. So two things we can do. The first one is signaling, and the second one is create products. So just uh, one minute on what signaling is about and things that we've done at BNP Paribas. The very first thing that we've done, like Microsoft and other companies, is to map our business along the uh, SDGs. I didn't bring you the slides. Uh, it turns out that we do cover all of them in several times, which is not surprising because banks, fortunately and sadly, we don't do anything tangible. We're a pass-through of money. Um, so we may finance good or um, not so good projects, but this is how we map our um, business. The second thing is we set targets, and one of them is that by 2018, at least 15% of our financing um, fund directly projects which, uh, which are related to the SDGs. Today we're at 16.5%, which means we'll raise the target soon. Um, incentives. We have 13 public KPIs around um, these endeavors. One of them um, so is about the percentage of loans to SDGs, and 20% of the variable compensation of our top 5,000 officers is linked to the achievement of that target in 2018. All right, now products. So I believe banks are hold the key of this capitalism to the common good. For one reason, banks, we are in the business of bridging money between projects and investors. And investment banks in particular, we are in the business of transforming risk. And remember, I mentioned that the investor wants return, a safe risk, and liquidity. So here is the opportunity. This is the amount of money that's gonna change hands over the next 30 years or so about $41 trillion are going to change hands from baby boomers and Gen X to millennials. And we know this generation and people who live with this generation, and I associate myself to that, are very conscious and want to bring purpose to their investments. So this is what we want to invest in. The reality is if I offer you that, you won't put your money into it. Okay, so here is an example of a product that we've done with the World Bank. We've done several, actually, for the last three years. And last March, we launched the very first uh, sustainable bond with the, for the World Bank that is linked to the SDGs. So investing in a solar farm in Tanzania doesn't work for us. We want safety. So what we did is we selected a bunch of proje sustainable projects around the world with the World Bank and wrap that, them into a bond. So now we've transformed project risk into a World Bank AAA credit risk. The problem is, now you're gonna get 2% or so, which you don't want, you want more upside, hopefully. So we've transformed that yield into an equity return. If you believe the equity market will do better over the next 10 or 15 years, this is the transformation we've done. Now, you don't want the stock return of any basket, of everything and anything, so We've filtered this um, many ways. We've excluded what we don't want. We've taken the best in class in the insurers, in, in the banks, etc. And especially we've kept the 50 companies where at least 20% of their revenues address at least one of the SDGs. And on top of it, we control for a number of financial parameters so it fits the requirement. And finally, we and the World Bank have committed to provide daily liquidity on this product so the day you want your money back, you can have it. And those fairly engineered products usually are available to the wealthy, which have a, a billion dollars to spare, and the face value is usually a quarter million dollars. Well, we've put a face value of a thousand dollars, so that anyone, and it was di distributed by a number of banks around the world, UBS, Deutsche Bank, and so on, so that the retail investor can invest in. So to wrap up, this is the one example of um, a product uh, with partners that can bring the private sector much closer to what we call impact investing. Thank you. So audience, please have, uh, uh, take some time to think about some questions for our panelists, and I'll start actually, if I may, 
Um, so, Mr. DeCru, there was a provocative uh, speech about uh, ODA versus private investment. Uh, the reality is, though, that there are some investments in this world that need public financing and that there are some that need private financing, and then there's a different set that could require a bit of both. So, as Minister of Development, how do you think about drawing that distinction to say ODA or international public finance needs to go into these sectors or these industries or these regions and that the private sector can take care of mm -hmm. other parts? And then I'll ask you a question right after. Well, I, I think that the, the first thing that needs to change is that we move from measuring inputs to measuring outputs. The whole into, uh, development finance today, world today is looking at how much money you spend. And myself as a minister, I will be seen as a good minister if I spend a lot of money. And if I do not spend a lot of money, I will be seen as a bad minister. Whereas there is a whole other question is, what's the impact of what you are, uh, of what you are doing? I'm not convinced that pouring in more money is always the right, uh, the right investment. Very often, this is about um, empowering people. And yes, obviously, providing education is one of the key of the key elements, and providing healthcare is one of the other uh, key elements, and investing in family planning is actually one of the best things, best investments that you can uh, you can do. But it is much more about um, accountability, um, about the effectiveness of the investments that we are doing, than it really is about how much more should money should we be uh, be, be be pouring in. If you make sure that people are strong enough, if you make sure that there is a tension between population and its governments. I mean, today what we see is that too often, governments, some governments are so dependent on external financing from development aid that it doesn't matter if the population is happy with the policy or not, because the financing is coming from another way. In, an, in, an, in a classic democracy, classic functioning nation, well, as a population, you give a mandate to political leadership with your tax money, and if you're happy, you will continue so. If you're not happy, there is, there is a rupture which is going to, uh, to come. That level of accountability towards the population and not towards the international world, I think, is the key, uh, is key element. And if you have a stable environment with political will, then external financing can do a lot of things. Interesting. But if there's no political will, then I think it's very hard to achieve progress. Great. Harvey, question for you. Thank you very much for this presentation about the SDG bonds. It's really an innovative product, and you and, and your colleagues deserve a lot of credit for that. What do you see as one or two areas where public policy could help change how the financial system works so that products that you're developing can be scaled quicker and money can be invested at, at a quicker pace than it currently is? So first of all, that's going to be my personal opinion and not yep. the firm that employs me because I don't, <laughs> uh, I don't mean to opine on policy. But uh, one example that has worked very well in France, as a matter of fact, um, it's the so-called 90-10 funds. Um, first of all, 90-10 funds are uh, funds where, which are 90% so-called SRI, socially responsible investing. So it's typical listed equities, which, which have been filtered to basically not do bad. And 10%, which is impact investing. Um, so it can be in, in, the home, in the domestic developed country. Uh, it can be social businesses, where the social impact comes first. And what was interesting in terms of policy, uh, in the early 2000s, France enacted a law for, that any company that has at least 50 employees must offer at least one 90-10 fund within its um, pension plan and within its employee incentive schemes. And as a result, um, because of this ability to, uh, obligation to offer, that has driven billions of uh, euros into uh, impact investing in, in, uh, in France. So that's one example of a, a mandatory law. It doesn't oblige people to invest in, but there is an obligation for the employer to offer such one. Fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? We have just a few minutes. Here and here. Please. Are there mics or? No. OK. I'll repeat your question. 
Yeah. administrative expenses as it okay <laughs> and, and and please quickly because we yeah we're okay being basically rushed, yeah. ODA you said it's um, it's not very progressive and I think that is right true and um, because basically in my country when you look at ODA 50% of the ODA that actually comes in goes into administrative expenses and little of it actually gets to the people that need it why don't um, ODA be invested in mechanization of farming or in industrialization? Because it's from the Ghanaian president, he said, um, we're farming, we're producing cocoa, but at the end of the day, the more money, more money is coming in from industrialized nations like um, where you, Switzerland, where you have um, chocolates coming out from. So why don't you invest more in systems like industrialization, mechanization, and if you do that, people get to farm, they get to make more money, you build a crop of entrepreneurs that can now take care of themselves. They don't need your aid to go to the hospital, you don't need to buy malaria drugs for anybody, you don't need to pay for, you know, because they have the funds to be able to do those things. So what Great. do you think can be done about that? Thank you very much, and we'll take the second question. Um, thank you very much. Um, the question um, I was going to ask you is, uh, you did talk about financing, so obviously you didn't touch about lack of um, um, expertise and institutional capacity to access some of this funding in Africa. I, I mean, I work for United Nations, um, United, United Nations University in, in, in Tokyo, and I led one of the biggest studies in the history of climate change. And one of the, the, the outcome of this finding is lack of institutional capacity. How do, you, how do you address that? Because there is part of money under UNFCCC and they, don't, they can't access it. And that's the problem. So uh, quickly, I, th I think first of all, when, when people are educated and healthy, a lot of things are possible. And I think that's the basics. Make sure that um, a girl gets the choice to not become pregnant at the age of 12, but just go to school and take her own life in her own, uh, in her own hands, make sure that the, the basic healthcare is, is there, and provide enough freedom. If there is freedom of enterprise, if there is an, e an equalizing taxation system, a lot of things will happen. And, and I'm not sure that governments need to set up whole types of industrialization uh, processes. In general, governments are not so good at that. What governments should do is provide the basis and People, are, people who are healthy and well-educated are entrepreneurial everywhere. And just make it possible for people to construct their own country, to build their own country, not only through politics, but also through, through economic and, and social uh, things. Maybe on institutional capacity. Look, um, institutional capacity in the end, what is it? In the end, it's human capacity, right? So too often, investments in cap what we call capacity building gets eaten up by per diems being paid to uh, government officials traveling throughout the world and not in the end being the most sound uh, investment. If you invest in strong people, strong people will build strong institutions. Um, investing in strong institutions in the end is money which is one way or another down, uh, down the drain. So I think the common element with both questions is invest in people. Don't invest in institutions, infrastructure, and so on. If you invest in people who are healthy, free, and educated, great things will happen. Uh, maybe I'll add and share two points. One, one is um, the importance of leverage. Um, the, uh, there's not enough taxpayers' money. There's not enough philanthropic funds, and it's the same with multilateral funds. So you can spend billions, but there, there is a limit to that. The power of the private sector is, is leverage. You take the example of a bank. You put $100, the bank will lend 1000 So we need to, 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 to get those private sector metrics and of return to leverage uh, the amount of money. The second thing is there is a lack of instruments. 
Um, all our instruments in finance are based where we reward capital much more than we reward labor. In other words, we, we've developed zillions of, me of mechanisms to, f to fund those who take risk to make money, but have fo f fallen short in developing mechanisms to uh, raise funds for those who take risk to help others. Some products are being developed, but we're, uh, this is the beginning of the journey. Fantastic. Well, I think that's a, a nice way to end it. This is the beginning of a long journey. A lot of brainstorming is needed, and let's all remember that we're talking about trillions of dollars for the SDGs. So um, it's been a real pleasure to have uh, been on a panel with both of you, and uh, look forward to continuing the day's discussions. Thank you. Thank you.